Yesterday, Sierraji spoke about one of the f- factors uh, called Sambojanga, Samadhi Sambojanga, neither briefly nor elaborately, in connection with the work of practice. Today, he has come to the last of the seven Sambojangas, Upeka Sambojanga. And he will cover this too in a way that is not too brief, not too elaborate, combining theory and practice. If one were to elaborate, it would take a long time. And Sierraji has been speaking in this way so that one can know both from a theoretical and a practical standpoint what these factors are so that one will recognize them. And he's, he's doing this to the extent of his abilities to teach what the Buddha taught as instructed by the late Most Venerable Mahasi Siyaro in order to show the virtues of the Dhamma and so the Dhamma blood will be generated, developed and there will, we will become Dhamma relatives. If the Dhamma family grows to become numerous then there's sure to be world peace and Sayadaji has no other hope than that. The word Tatra Mazatata is very interesting. Tatra refers to whatever object there is. And Majata Majatata means impartiality the equanimity the the mind is the mind is not going going to one leaning to one side or another no matter what the object is this is equanimity and there are ten or upeka and there are ten kinds of upeka described in the texts the type of upeka that is meant here is tatra majatata upeka. So this, um, the mind and matter that really exist, which are related as cause and effect, are always occurring at the six sense doors, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, taste, uh, sorry, tongue, body, mind. So there's objects of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, bending, stretching, lifting, moving, placing, blinking, opening, and closing the eyes. Even when we are asleep, mind and matter are continuing. And at that time, the mind all the time the mind has a factor which is like a controller of it. So even though one is asleep, the mind has this control keeping the mind together. And the body, matter, also has a factor that keeps the different physical particles together. So there's no stop to this. There's no let up. There's no rest in the continuity of mind and matter. And all these different types of objects that can be observed is what is meant by tatra. And if there's no mental energy, if the mind doesn't have any energy, then there will be partiality. So when one meets up, encounters something that is good, then one will tend to go for that, follow it. 
uh, and some a better object more so and when some when we encounter something that is really fantastic really good then one won't want to separate from that good object and if there's something that one dislikes then too there will be a re- a reaction pushing against it opposing it and that can range from just mild dislike dissatisfaction to the extreme of hatred for ordinary people this is most of what happens when there is something the mind likes then there will be loba greed when there's something the mind dislikes there will be dosa dosa anger and there will always be confusion delusion of moha this arises together with loba it arises together with dosa so early on in the practice this is what happens there's no equanimity uh, one the mind is either going for, going for the good things or pushing away the bad things and during with the practice we have to insert uh, put energy into the mind we have to protect the mind so that the nivaranas the obstacles to wholesomeness and to concentration gradually retreat they gradually uh, decline and when the mind becomes free of them the mind becomes energized and especially at the stage of udiyabhya jnana seeing the fast arising and passing away of phenomena the mind becomes quite energized as seruj as seruj mentioned there are two phases of this udiyabhya jnana the the early stage or immature stage and the mature stage and the the energy of the the qualities of pt and sukha joyous interest and happiness these are a bit uh agi- a bit moving they have they have the quality of movement and activity and at this time the samadhi uh, can't really con- control as well but at the mature stage the some because these qualities pt and sukha drop out then the samadhi becomes better stronger and then the quality of tatra majata majata upeka arises equanimity and this is a factor of bodhi jnana the the knowledge which um the knowledge of the four noble truths or in other words it is a support it's a cause of one who sees the four noble truths who gains bodhi jnana so it is called tatra majata upeka or upeka sambhojanga among the seven sambhojangas except for the last one the others can be divided into three groups of two in one group there is virya effort pt which is joyous interest or rapture and tama vidya which is um, investigation of tama and these these three are rather active and they make the mind happy if one doesn't note them when they happen then the mind can get into being scattered and in the other group there is pasati tranquility samadhi concentration and upeka equanimity and these are the more stable these are have the quality of stability and if also one doesn't observe these when they happen then the mind tends to slide back a bit so one has to balance these 
and when one's experience is good but the mind starts to slide back then one has to boost the energizing factors and the the meditation teacher needs to tell the yogi uh, to do this that should should guide the yogi in this way in the same way too when the when the um when the when the mind goes into gets into being scatteredness scattered the teacher also has to do the same so it's important to say to speak about how how viriya arises how pt arises how tama vijya arises and it's also important to say how how pasati comes about how samadhi comes about how upeka comes about and this is what is called in pali bojangancha anupavutanataya that means that the factors of bodhi anga sorry of of bodhi jnana the causes for bodhi jnana they need to be balanced appropriately and the guidance of the meditation teacher is very important at this point yes at this stage in the practice so there are these two groups the energetic bojangas and the peaceful bojangas and um, when they're out of balance an example of uh, what this is like is in the old days when people would go on a trip they would harness up two horses to a carriage and then uh, go along with the horses pulling and if one horse is stronger the horse will pull in his or her direction and then the driver has to work to restrain the horse so that the the carriage goes in a straight line along the road but at this stage in the practice that it's like driving a carriage where the two horses are evenly matched one just can drive comfortably and this stage is very uh, very important an example of it a modern example is when we have a good car we're driving a good car on a good road and there's nothing in the way there's nothing to worry about so we can just drive along just cruise along very comfortably so again it is the part of the practice where one is driving a carriage that is being pulled by a team of very of well matched horses and this is this is called tatra majatupeka this whatever object arises viewing viewing it with impartiality if one reaches this stage a yogi can experience the overcoming of chronic diseases that he or she has had to begin with in the time of the buddha both the venerable mahakasapa mahamogalana the buddha himself they happened to breathe air that had pollen from a poisonous tree and this made them very sick and they had a fever and when the venerable mahakasapa was sick with this the buddha at that time went to venerable mahakasapa and asked him about his condition and the venerable mahakasapa replied i'm not any better but as he was an arahant he had no mental suffering arahants can bear a lot they don't add mental suffering to physical suffering so at that time the buddha preached about the dhamma of the bojangas and the venerable mahakasapa listened to this 
and when he when he heard it the thought occurred to him these tamas these bojangas occurred to me uh, they occurred in me after i became a monk on the on the day on the on the day that i became fully enlightened these tamas arose in me and then the thought that occurred to him was the buddha's teaching is truly one of liberation so as when one remembers their success the mind becomes energized so too with the venerable mahakasapa he remembered his enlightenment like this and his disease went away completely initially he had he was sick because of breathing in the pollen of, of a from a poisonous tree that was blossoming in america there is a lot of there's pollen they call it pollen and um when in areas where there's a lot of pollen then it it makes it hard to breathe and it can make one feel quite sick so this is a similar similar to the disease that the venerable mahakasapa was experiencing so he listened to the dhamma of the bojangas that the buddha preached and he remembered these occurred in me and at that pt joyous interest rapture arose and his disease disappeared so it has this power one who practices according to the method of practice and one knows one comes to know the virtue of the dhamma which elevates and bears the practitioner such a person listens respectfully to the dhamma and while listening to the dhamma one compares what is heard with one's own experience and if it matches then one feels joy this happens the teaching of the buddha which is to make our physical verbal and mental behavior clean is really a path to liberation so one will come to decide this for oneself not because of thinking about it not because of reflecting on it or reading books or hearing about it but one will decide this because it is what one has experienced because of practicing as instructed one realizes the virtue of the dhamma and then one feels happy this happiness one feels one moment after another and because of this mind rupa or matter becomes very clean and especially the blood it is said lohitan pasidi the blood circulates well throughout the body and the blood is also generated by the dhamma new blood and so the blood becomes very clean and therefore upada rupang visudan hoti avosi that means that the dependent matter becomes very clean completely clean for example one's complexion one's complexion becomes clear one's uh, vision becomes quite clear if one's eyes were originally uh, not able to see very well one's vision Im- improves sounds because sounds are very clear what one tastes 
the taste of the Dhamma is unlike any other taste. It's a very good taste. So what one observes becomes very clear, and the sense organs themselves, the eyes, the ears, the nose becomes unblocked, the tongue becomes able to taste in a very refined way, and one's body becomes very sensitive to touch. So this is what is meant by the dependent matter becomes very clean. The objects and the sense bases become quite clean. And this happens not only for the venerable Mahakasapa in the time of the Buddha. Even now this is happening for yogis who practice respectfully. Because the momentum is good of this, because of the influence of this mind, the also what happens in the case of, uh, as it says in the text, that just the way a drop of water slides off the leaf of a water lily, so too the disease that the uh, Mahakasapa had been suffering from, it didn't progress, but it just left his body just in the same way. It didn't stick. This disease, uh, the body initially uh, was ill due to the scent from the poisonous tree, or in modern terms, to, due to the pollen that had been inhaled. But because of the because of the joy, the, the, this, the disease left his body. And this Dhamma, when, it is, when one practices, and greed, hatred, and delusion are removed to some extent, to whatever extent they are, this, um, the mind becomes, the mind that arises causes the blood to become clean. And because this clean blood circulates well throughout the body, it aids in generating new materiality. The new, the new cells that arise because of this purified blood, with the help of this purified blood, are very, very good. And that is how the disease is overcome. It's quite amazing. At the present day, there are many people who have disease, and Sayaroji too uh, had a disease that he overcame by doing meditation. And another case is a woman who practiced, and she had a stomach disease, and um, she she came, she practiced, and when she reached the stage when Vedanas arise strongly, uh, they were quite extreme, and she was unable to eat anything at all, so she couldn't take any medicine. And for 20 days like this, she suffered from the disease, and then she went home to practice. And Siyadaji instructed her to get some Satumadu, uh, and take it every two hours and to practice as instructed. And she did this. And uh, as, as she was practicing as instructed, the Vedana painful feelings arose and became <clears throat> the feel, painful feelings associated with her disease became very strong. And as she continued to observe, there was no abdomen, there was no stomach, there was no rising, no falling. There was just movement and pain. And because there was no form appearing in her mind, there was no sense of I or mine. There was just pain and knowing the pain. And as she continued to note like this, 
joy arose as she continued, so it became a joyful pain to observe in this way. And continuing to practice, sweat poured out of her body and soaked her clothes completely. And at that point, the stomach disease was overcome. There is also a case of a woman who had a, a, a blood a disease of blood pressure. And she too, when she observed her symptoms, the difficult, uncomfortable feelings energetically without giving up, she was able to get the upper hand on this, to continue noting until uh, overcoming the conceptual level of form. And her concentration became strong enough so that she was able to overcome the disease. So when there are uncomfortable feelings in this way, don't give up. One should observe them continue to observe if it becomes to the comes to the point where one can't bear it then one has to back off a bit and observe it in a more relaxed way and if one if then again as the feelings increase one has to observe them until they become unbearable uh, and then if it gets to be too much you reduce your energy but in doing this three or four times like this uh, if one still hasn't been able to gain the upper hand on the on the difficult feeling then one can just ignore it just let go of it and go back to a, another object like the rising and the falling and that gives one the chance to um, develop more concentration and work with the pain again when it arises. So if the yogi works in this way, they will be able to overcome the discomfort. Before one reaches this stage, the yogis, sometimes the noting goes well and sometimes the noting is bad. And when one meets up with something bad, then there's apagamana, one becomes dissatisfied with it. This is dosa, anger, basically. And when one meets up with something good, there's one goes along with it, one sticks to it. This is upagamana. Or in an, another way of saying it is that uh, the mind becomes partial. There's when there's something one likes, there's following that, which is anuroda, and that's basically greed. Or with something that one uh, dislikes, then there's opposition, viroda, which is basically dosa, anger. But at this stage, when the factors of samadhi and upeka are strong, then this doesn't happen when one meets up with an object, when one encounters an object that is unpleasant, disgusting, dislikable, there's no opposition to it, and one doesn't push it away. And one encounters an object that is what the one considers favorable, likable. There's also no reaction of moving towards it. The mind falls in the middle. The mind is equanimous in the face of all these objects. And if one continues in the practice, this is what one experiences most of the time. When one overcomes the uncomfortable feelings in one's body and equanimity arises, then the yogi can continue with their practice very comfortably, like the person who is driving a carriage with a team of well, well-matched horses, or like the person who is driving a good car on a good road 
with nothing in their way. So if at this stage, just keep going because you are sure to realize special Dhamma. At this stage, instead of Vedana Pachya Tanha, there is Vedana Pachya Panya. Before this stage, due to feelings, good, bad, or neutral, there is craving. When there's discomfort, one wants something comfortable. When there's something that is pleasant, one wants more. And at this stage, though, what there is is santi, peaceful feeling. The mind is not following the likes or pushing away the dislikes. This, too, is something that one can't hold on to. One also shouldn't be attached to this neutrality. When the mind reaches the point where it says, whatever comes, I'll just note it. Whatever it is, I'll note it. Then just keep on going, because at this stage, Within a few days, one is sure to experience special Dhamma. These Dhammas of the Bojangas, when do they start to come into the yogi's mind? Some meditation teachers say these are present from the start of the practice. How can they possibly be present at the start before citta visuddhi, purity of mind, has occurred? These bojangas, they have they don't occur at the stage where one sees the difference between nama and rupa. They haven't occurred yet. They haven't occurred when one starts to see how nama and rupa, mind and matter are related as cause and effect. And they haven't even occurred when one sees how mind and matter, which are related as cause and effect, are not permanent. They are suffering and they are mere process without a self, although there's the bit of a glimpse at this point. But when Vedanas have been overcome, and one sees how the old is continually replaced by the new in a very quick way, then the bojangas are arising, piti, pasadi, and so on. When upeka arises, piti and sukha are no longer present. And with the arising of upeka, then the, som, sam, the sambojangas, these factors, are complete. So the yogis should understand this from the standpoint of theory as well as practice, 